Greetings students and welcome back to my lectures on nonlinear dynamics. In this video I'm going to talk about flows on a circle. I'll first discuss the dynamical systems or differential equations leading to flows on a circle, followed by uniform and non-uniform oscillators. Remember that in the last few videos on nonlinear dynamics, we discussed differential equations involving dx by dt, where x is a variable on a straight line. But what if we slightly modify this differential equation from dx by dt equals f of x to d theta by dt equals f of theta? The variable theta now represents a point along a circle. Theta is such that 0 is the positive horizontal axis of the circle, pi by 2 is the positive vertical axis, pi is the negative horizontal axis, 3 pi by 2 is the negative vertical axis, and 2 pi is the positive horizontal axis again once we make a full revolution from 0. The unique thing about writing differential equations in terms of theta is that they're capable of oscillating. By virtue of theta being a point on a circle, you can have it return to where it started simply by going straight. Because it's a circle, the fact that you're going straight will eventually cause you to end up back where you started, hence the oscillation. This is in contrast to autonomous differential equations like dx by dt equals f of x, where x is a variable on a straight line. I proved that in a previous video that these systems are not capable of oscillating. With the exception though of this oscillation business, the dynamical systems dx by dt and d theta by dt are very similar. You'll recall from my earlier videos that dx by dt can be thought of as a vector field on a line. In the same manner, d theta by dt can be thought of as a vector field on a circle. But let me define first what a vector field on a circle is, because there's a bit of nuance here that's missed in the discussion on dx by dt. A vector field on a circle is a rule that assigns a unique velocity vector, or d theta by dt value, to each point on a circle. It's basically a function, so for every input or theta, there must be one and only one output or velocity vector. So for a function f of theta to then be considered a vector field on a circle, it must be a 2 pi periodic function. So f of theta plus 2 pi must equal f of theta for all real values of theta. If it's not 2 pi periodic, then what's going to happen is that for a given point theta on a circle, we'll get two values for f of theta, because this point corresponds not only to theta, it also corresponds to theta plus 2 pi, which represents a revolution on the circle uh, relative to theta. And because we'll get two values for f of theta, if f is not 2 pi periodic, we end up with two different velocities applied to the same point, which is just not possible. That's not a valid vector field. Let me give an example. Consider the dynamical system given by d theta by dt equals theta. Let me draw a circle and let's look at the point theta naught equals pi by 4. At this point, the rate of change of theta is also pi by 4 radians per second. If I now follow this velocity vector circle counterclockwise around the circle, and I come back around to a point where theta is 9 pi by 4, the rate of change of theta now is 9 pi by 4. So at the same point, we had the rate of change of theta equal to both pi by 4 and 9 pi by 4. That's simply not possible for a valid vector field. You can't have two different velocities at the same point, which is why this dynamical system on a circle is not a valid vector field. So this example should illustrate why a function that isn't 2 pi periodic cannot be a valid vector field on a circle. Anyway, let's go to an actual valid example of a vector field on a circle, starting with the uniform oscillator. Suppose I had a dynamical system given by d theta by dt equals omega, where omega is some constant. This is a very simple differential equation to solve. You just straight up integrate both sides and end up with theta of t equals omega t plus theta naught, where theta naught is the integration constant that also happens to be the angle you start at, your initial condition. Here's what the solution looks like schematically. If I draw a circle, then the solution to the uniform oscillator starts at theta naught and then just goes around and around the circle at a constant angular velocity omega. Note that because omega is just a constant, it is automatically too high periodic because it's just constant. So this is indeed a valid vector field. The next important flow on a circle we'll talk about is the non-uniform oscillator. 
Broadly speaking, the non-uniform oscillator basically involves a dynamical system that represents flows on a circle, but instead of having a constant or uniform rate of change, it has a non-uniform rate of change given by f of theta, where f is not a fixed constant. It still has to be 2 pi periodic though, as we discussed earlier. A famous example of a non-uniform oscillator is where the function f is given by omega minus a sine theta, where omega and a are constants. Let's analyze this dynamical system for the case where a is non-negative and omega is positive. We'll show later that you can repeat this analysis for negative values of a and omega, and except for a few changed values, the qualitative takeaways from that negative value analysis aren't really that different. Let's start by finding the fixed points of this dynamical system. To do that, we'll set d theta by dt equals 0 and solve for our fixed point, which I'll call theta sub f. When we solve this equation, we'll find that theta sub f is the inverse sine of omega over a. Given the value of this fixed point, we can imagine three different scenarios corresponding to a positive omega and positive a. In the first scenario, omega is greater than a. In that case, we're taking the inverse sine of something that's greater than 1. This is clearly not possible since the sine of a real number can never be greater than 1, which means that when omega is greater than a, there are no fixed points since theta sub f simply cannot exist. Now in the second scenario, omega and a are equal to each other. In this case, our fixed point is the inverse sine of 1, which is pi by 2 plus 2 pi n, where n is some integer. But if we're talking about flows on a circle, this really only corresponds to a single fixed point since points like 5 pi by 2 are 360 degrees from the original pi by 2 fixed point, which pretty much exactly overlaps with pi by 2. And finally, in the third scenario where omega is less than a, we've got our fixed point equal to the inverse sine of something that's less than 1. On a circle, this actually corresponds to two unique fixed points. Why is that? Well, let me give you a numerical example to illustrate. Say I want the inverse sine of 0.5. Well, you might already know that the answer is pi by 6 or 30 degrees. The other answer to this is 5 pi by 6 or 150 degrees if we're talking only about angles between 0 and 2 pi. So it should make sense to you that when we're taking the arc sine of something less than 1, we'll get two unique values if we are to consider flows on a circle. Let's now visualize each of these scenarios. To do that, we'll draw face portraits of d theta by dt as a function of theta. Initially, we'll consider phase portraits on a plane instead of a circle, and then we'll draw the circle phase portrait using the one that we've constructed on the plane. We'll start with the first scenario where omega is greater than a and there are no fixed points. When we construct the graph of d theta by dt as a function of theta, we get a phase portrait that looks like this, where the entire phase portrait is above the horizontal axis, so the flows are always directed to the right, i.e. theta is always increasing. The wrinkle here is that as theta gets close to pi by 2, the rate of change of theta with respect to time becomes smaller. So even though theta is still increasing, it just increases more slowly. So if the particle is moving quickly before pi by 2, it slows down as it gets closer to pi by 2. And so the values of theta near pi by 2 constitute a bottleneck for our particle. If we were to draw this phase portrait on a circle, then it would look something like this. Since the d theta by dt term is always positive when omega is greater than a, the flow on the circle will always be in the positive or counterclockwise direction. It's just that when we get to theta equals pi by 2, the flow will slow down a bit because d theta by dt at pi by 2 is omega minus a. In contrast, at theta equals 3 pi by 2 when sine theta is negative 1, meaning our d theta by dt is omega plus a, we'll get our particle flowing really quickly. Let's move to the second scenario, where omega equals a and there's one fixed point at theta equals pi by 2. When we construct the graph of d theta by dt as a function of theta, we get a phase portrait that looks like this with my fixed point right here. The derivative is positive to the left of the fixed point, so theta wants to increase towards the fixed point on the left side. However, to the right of the fixed point, the derivative d theta by dt is also positive. So on the right side, my theta wants to increase away from the fixed point. 
So we end up with a half stable fixed point. It's stable on the left because it attracts flows from the left and it's unstable on the right because it repels away flows from its right. If we were to draw this phase portrait on a circle then it would look something like this. For the most part since d theta by dt is positive the flow on this circle will generally be in the counterclockwise direction. The exception occurs when we get to theta equals pi by 2 where the flow will stop because this is our fixed point. And as we just discussed, this fixed point is half stable with flows approaching it from one side and going away from it on the other side. And finally, let's discuss the third scenario where there are two fixed points. When we construct the corresponding phase portrait, it looks like this with my two fixed points here and here. The derivative is positive to the left of the first fixed point, so theta wants to increase towards that fixed point. To the right of that first fixed point, the derivative is negative, so theta wants to decrease towards that fixed point. And finally, to the right side of the second fixed point, d theta by dt is positive. So for the second fixed point on the right side, my theta wants to increase away from that fixed point. So in the end, we end up with one stable fixed point on the left that theta is attracted to and one unstable fixed point on the right that theta is repelled from. And if we were to draw this phase portrait on a circle, then it would look something like this with two fixed points. One of those fixed points, which comes earlier in our counterclockwise rotation, will be stable. The second point, which comes later in our counterclockwise rotation, will be unstable. And I've labeled the flows accordingly. Anyway, that should do it for this video. I've explained flows on a circle and how you can construct circular phase portraits to analyze these unique dynamical systems. Now, if omega and a were negative, you can pretty much just repeat this analysis, but now with negative omega and negative a's. I will leave you to do that as an exercise, but it's fairly similar to what we've already shown. I'd like to thank the following patrons for their support, and if you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the faculty of Khan, signing out.